Welcome to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese, a program that can help you become liberated in the modern world. Now, here's your host, Dr. Kevin W. Reese. Have you ever heard of fruitarianism? <laughs> Certainly you've heard of veganism, or people claiming to be plant-based. From the health aspect, fruitarianism might be a step above, if you will. But there's also an ethical standpoint to it. And in order to be fruitarian, there's a lifestyle that comes along with it. Welcome to episode number 34. Today, I'm going to be talking to Mango Wadzak. He's a health educator. He's written a bunch of books that are available. He's an animal rights advocate. And he's a veteran fruitarian. And along with his wife, has created a little paradise in Australia, away from society, taking the fruitarian lifestyle to the max, living on acres of lands, planting trees. There's work that comes along with that. He's created peace within himself through his fruitarian lifestyle. So it's a pleasure to have Mango call in from Australia to do this episode. You'll hear his, his sort of local wilderness behind him as we talk. And I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Because, you know, this episode, it's much more than just fruit and diet. It's about the earth. It's about nature. It's about living in society, but not being of society. Enjoy. So, Mango, you're like the fruitarian alien, man. I, I saw a picture of you at a grocery store with a cart totally full of, of, of oranges. <laughs> you're barefoot, and people in line yes. are staring at you. That's true. What's it like being uh, a fruitarian alien, so to speak? That happens here very often. We get people asking, oh, what are you going to do with all those cucumbers? Or what are you going to do with all those oranges or all those watermelons? And, and we explain <laughs> that we're, uh, we're going to juice them. Um, yeah, we eat, drink a lot of juice every day. And people, are, you know, people aren't kind of, they're not aggressive or, or objectionable in any way. They're, they're generally... Open, well, a lot of them are open-minded and they listen to what you're saying. Sure. Uh, so long as you don't push an agenda on them too much. Yeah, and of course you get hit with the sugar question. I mean, that is natural, I guess. At yeah, this yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people that think that eating too much fruit is going to make you fat, but I just want to look at me. I mean, there's not an ounce of fat on me. No. Um, yeah, uh, too much sugar. Uh, I say you've you probably never meet a fruitarian with diabetes. Um, no. Not that there's many of us around, uh, but I think that diabetes is definitely not an issue which a fruitarian is ever going to get. No, I mean, back when I had, you know, when I was practicing and I had clients, I mean, I'd, I'd put a diabetic on, you know, just to prove them that that their, their sugar wasn't going to go crazy. I would... Uh, I'd have them eat a big dinner of grapes and they'd, yeah. wake up, they'd wake up in the middle of the night and come downstairs and get food because their sugar was low and they're trying to justify, well, I just had a lot of grapes. How come my sugar is low? Not high. Yeah, that's right. People are very unaware of this. Stuff. <laughs> they're very, very unaware. There's a huge difference between processed sugar that's all wrapped up in, in fat and, 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 uh, and wheat products. Uh, to sugar which is contained and locked into a fruit it's a very very different thing very one is perfectly is. natural the other one is very denatured that's right that's right I, and I, I seriously doubt there's any great apes out there with diabetes you know so <laughs> no, absolutely yeah yeah and so you've been fruitarian for Almost 30 years, is that correct? Um, 
Well, strictly speaking, I I embraced the idea in 1992, but uh, it would be untruthful of me to say that I succeeded with it immediately. So mm -hmm. I've been on that path for, for a long time now. What is it? Is it maybe 28 years or whatever? Yeah. Um, but uh, I made a lot of mistakes, especially in the first decade, and a lot of slip slip ups and going back to eating foods that I knew were not good for me. But I never slipped up on being vegan. I embraced uh, veganism in 1987, and that for me. Uh, was very, very much a moral issue, which I felt like I could never um, go back on. Turn, turn my back on, yeah. Yeah, no, same but, thing. Uh, same thing with e me. Eating, eating raw food is much uh, more of a challenge because the, the food that you've been eating before is like so very addictive that you pull to it all the time. So it takes it takes an awful lot of getting your head in the right space to be able to actually pull it off. Right, right. Yeah. It, I mean, it's it's a transcendent type of thing where you have to go above these cravings because we all have these patterns of cravings <laughs> from when we were kids Absolutely. and teenagers. Yeah, kind of really we're craving, I think, when we're eating, when we're hooked on cookies and chocolate because uh, like most, most lollies that you can buy or sweets or candies, as you call them in the U.S., they, they're... um. They've got like fruit as a flavoring in them. That's right. So it's kind of like they're trying to, they, but instead of giving you fruit, they're giving you these these candies that are um, that have got fruit flavors in them, which aren't even real fruit. It's like yeah. designed in a laboratory somehow, yeah. and and it's made from it's made from animal bones. A lot of it. Yeah, it, like, it's perverse, really. Yeah, a lot of candies are made from. The anus of beavers. <laughs> uh, there's a gland in the anus of beavers that yeah. has some sort of flavoring, and, and they use it in a lot of candies. Uh, I think they use them in cigarettes, don't they, too, to add some musky flavor to cigarettes or something. It's been a traditional ingredient. Oh, wow. Yeah, I never, I never heard that one. But, but you're right, Mango. You know... Yeah. The corporations even know that fruit is our original food because yeah. they create fake foods with fruit flavors. <laughs> exactly. Strawberry exactly. gum, watermelon, yeah. lollipop, yeah. Yeah. You know, Pop-Tarts. No, I was going to say, I don't rightfully know if it's a, a conspiracy and such that people know what they're doing, that they know that fruit's the original fruit, but they're trying to get us on there, but... But it is some kind of cosmic conspiracy. I think at some level there is a, there is this movement that's, or, or the, this mindset which is preventing us from returning, or getting back to how things should be. But I don't think on an individual level, you know, when a when a manufacturer produces a lolly, he doesn't really have any idea that, that most of them wouldn't have a clue that, that our natural food is fruit. It's right. just a, in the pursuit of money. Right. That that's kind of what's going on there. Yeah, capitalism. Capitalism, yeah. Now, I've heard through the grapevine that Australia is a great place for fruit. Is that true? Uh, Australia is a huge country. Right. And um, there are certain parts of it which are definitely aren't good for fruit. Uh, they're, they're, most of it actually is probably not because we have huge desert areas and a lot of unpopulated areas. You go anywhere like that and you're not going to find much fruit. If you go away from the cities or the large towns, you're going to have a hard time finding fruit. But if you stick to the coastline and you stick to towns and cities um, and the countryside around them, yeah, you especially especially up in the tropics where, where we're living, it's a good place to, to get fruit, yes, for sure. And I think that because a lot of people came over here from Europe and they really kind of had this ad kind of adventure spirit about them, really, of the farmers. And they, they went out ser uh, searching for seeds from different parts of the world and they brought them back here. And in this particular area, within like a 100 kilometer radius, I think we've probably got more varieties of fruit growing than anywhere else in the world. Mm. 
because of that, because people went out searching for seeds from everywhere and brought them back here and started growing things. Commercially, very, very difficult to get, to get hold of a lot of it. But if you know farmers, if you know the area, you can get hold of all kinds of different fruits that, that you would normally not find anywhere else. Right. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, veganism is taking off right now. Uh, there's a there's a so-called fake meat revolution coming right now. Yeah. And Absolutely. that's great. That's great for the animals. I don't know if it's great for the humans, but it's great for the animals. How long do you think it's going to take for, for for fruitarianism to sort of spread a little more? Because we're just hitting that vegan revolution now where it's actually yeah. accepted 10 years ago. Very different 10 years yeah. ago, at least in the States, in America. Yeah. Well, I think it could be on the horizon somewhere. Uh, I, I, if I go back in time, I mean, as I mentioned, I became vegan in 1987 and I didn't know anybody else who was vegan at the time of becoming vegan. Um, just so happened that my sister turned vegan who was living in a different country at more or less the same time. But apart from that, where I was living, I didn't know anybody. Uh, veganism, the word vegan was virtually unheard of. If you went there and told anybody you were vegan, they wouldn't know what it was. We've made huge strides since that time. And everybody kind of knows now of a vegan or has heard the word term. Some people, obviously, they don't like it, but it, it's there now and you can't escape from it. It's happening. And I think that uh, fruitarianism is probably around the, is actually past the stage that veganism was in 1987. Hmm. If you think about it, you know, people talking, there's a lot of people now that talk about raw veganism, uh, whereas veganism wasn't even known back then. And there's more people that know about raw veganism than there was that people that knew about veganism back in the 80s. Right. It could be closer. And you wrote a book about fruitarianism, correct? Absolutely. I've written um, uh, four books at the moment. Okay. Three of them are... Uh, Sort of, well, two of them are specifically about fruitarianism. One of them is more a call to anarchy, which, um, yeah, that's the last book that I've written. And one of them is autobiographical. But all of them uh, address the fruit issue. All of them kind of, that's my focus really in, in life. Not only that, but my, my, my primary focus really is to bring awareness about the plight of the farmed animals. Mm. Because I think there's an awful lot of people that, are embracing the raw lifestyle and even fruitarian lifestyle, and they don't really understand uh, what's going on with animal agriculture. They haven't really fully embraced uh, veganism, even though they call themselves raw vegan. They may occasionally slip up because for them it's a, a lifestyle, a diet choice rather than a lifestyle choice. Mm. So, so you know, it's rather like somebody can choose to be on a macrobiotic diet or whatever because they think it's healthy. And oh, this is the thing, macrobiotism, if that's, if that's a word. Uh, but then after a while, they get bored with it and they go back to something else and they eat other things again. And I think that's what happens with raw vegan. A lot of people think, yeah, that's a good idea. That's, that's what I want to do. And then after a while, because they haven't embraced veganism, they haven't embraced the fact that it's actually an ethical choice not to eat animals, not a dietary choice. Right. That's right. And, you know, factory farming is a very very brutal endeavor and a lot of people are sleeping while they're walking they don't understand that yeah unfortunately though i think there's still a lot of people that would see it and still not quit they would just say oh don't show me that <laughs> there's, there are a lot of people a lot more people now waking up to uh to what's going on when they're when they're faced with the facts and ac actually have the the guts and the consciousness to, to do something about it but for most, for the most part, I think most people are still at the stage where they're not going to do anything about it when they're faced with the truth. I know back uh, when I became sorry when I became vegan in the eighties, I presented a book to many of the people that I knew because I thought that if they saw this book, it was actually uh, the book by Peter Singer, Animal Liberation. I thought if they if they could see this book and read what was in it they would be kind of obliged really to not eat animals anymore. I just thought it was so obvious, but not one single person that I gave the book to 
had any revelation really or made any changes. They just told me, most of them said, look, don't, don't give me stuff like this to read. I'm not interested. Mm. Do you think that the fake meat revolution is going to change things for the environment and the animals? I suppose the easy answer is yes, uh, of course, if we can stop if we can stop systematically abusing animals, it's going to be a, a huge forward step. But um, I, I like, like you've uh, mentioned already, I think the idea of eating kind of fake meat is, it's not really going to be good for us. It's not really going to help us evolve. And the fake meats are starting to pop up in the fast food restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> so... That is, that's scary in a way. Yeah. I, I consider it scary because these people, this, these companies, kind of in many ways, they're steering the way the planet is being run. They're big, big, uh, big mega corps that, are, that are, have the money and the power behind them. And, it, and all they're doing it for is not for ethical reasons. They're just trying to get people on board to eat and, and give them money by, by eating whatever they give them. So yeah. the fact that they're now selling vegan burgers or whatever it might be, I think that we as vegans have a moral right to to, to not support that. Mm. We shouldn't be supporting those companies at all. We should be stepping away from them and saying, no, we don't give you any support. Mm. They, they're destroying the planet because they're going to carry on doing whatever it is they're doing as well as selling vegan burgers. Right. They're just capitalists at the end of the day. Cap- they're capitalists. Yeah, and we don't, from a health standpoint, we don't know the effects this fake meat's going to have. We're not going to know for another 10 or 20 years. There's no way to know right now. No. Mm. And and so now people are getting on it, and now they're cutting deals with McDonald's and Subway and Burger King. And, and mm. before, before you know it, there's going to be a vegan pizza joint on the corner in America. Yeah, and you know America yeah. is the the kingdom of capitalism. So it's so true. Man, yeah. things are about to change right in front of our eyes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, things are definitely moving forward, and and I, and I guess at some level you've got to be glad that this uh, anything that's going to stop the animal agri- animal agriculture is is good at some level. Yeah, but we have to be realistic and kind of see the bigger picture that, that uh, this is really about keeping the money, keeping control in the hands of the few. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At the end of the day, we are frugivores long before we became mm. hunter hunter gatherers, yep. and you know it's obvious with our thumbs, it's obvious with our digestive systems. If we see a, a, a roadkill. Nobody's going to look at that and think, "Oh, I didn't have breakfast breakfast this morning. I right. just wish I had a knife and fork with me." Or, right. you know, nobody's going to think that way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, fruit is just so obvious to me because of the flavor. Uh, there, you know, I, I stump people with this question sometimes. I'm just like, "Name me a food that tastes good without you altering it." Mm. There, there really is none. I mean, maybe you can make a case for a carrot. Maybe mm-hmm. you can make a case for mm-hmm. a beet. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, your delicious foods are melons and berries and oranges and apples and grapes. You don't have to cook it. You don't have to put salt on it. You don't have to touch it in any way. It's just there. You pick it, you wash it, you eat it. It's the ultimate fast food. It's just on the tree. You walk to the tree and I mean, obviously most people don't have access to trees these days, I suppose, but that's how it should be. Mm-hmm. You have a garden, you have fruit trees in it and you go to the garden and you, you pick a fruit tree when you're hungry and you eat that and move on to the next tree or go and play in the sunshine or whatever you want to do. Yeah, man. And, 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 you know, based on people that I know who sometimes go to islands like Hawaii or even in Puerto Rico, man, they yeah. always they always hit me back up like, hey, man, I was getting free fruit, papayas, and mm. avocados, and coconuts, and yeah. mangoes. Bananas, yeah. And I'm over here 
in the northeast of uh, America paying top dollar mm. <laughs> to get the same food. It's a sad world we're living, Kevin. We need more flu- more fruit trees, man. Absolutely. And we need to be planting more fruit trees like as individuals. That's, you yeah. know, what we should be doing with our lives instead of wasting them in offices and whatever it is that people do in pursuit of money. And and you you're planting trees out there in Australia, correct? Absolutely. We've got a um, we're only renting because we never had money to uh, to buy anywhere. But but as it happened, the universe uh, um, blessed us, and we happened to find a two and a half acre plot of land out in the country, which was basically just grass when we got here, and I've, I've got rid of all the grass or cut it down all short. And I've put in a lot of fruit trees since we've been here. Hmm. So we've got a uh, we've got avocados and black sapoti, white sapoti, hmm. uh, aki, aki hmm. fruit. Aki fruit's one of our favourite. We love them. A lot of different citrus, grapefruits, oranges, mandarins. Um, yeah, we have a, well, a lot more. A lot more. Obviously, a lot of bananas, papaya, pineapples. Um, yeah, and uh, I've not finished yet because I don't. It's not like I work all day or anything. On the contrary, I, I'll do mostly something in the morning, and and the next morning I'll do something, and yeah. So I've still got pockets of land that I, I need to put trees on uh, that I will eventually get to. It sounds amazing, man. <laughs> We're very, very blessed. We, we absolutely love it here. It's falling into our laps, and. Because we thought that, it, given our financial status, the fact that neither of us had any money to speak of, that we would never be able to afford to get land. Uh, and finding a rental property out in the country that's like this is, is quite difficult. But not only have we found a beautiful place to be, but we've got a, a really great landlord who um, is yeah, just the best, really. So uh, we hardly ever see him as well. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. And so you're eating a lot of fruit for free, right from the trees. Well, uh, uh, this time of year, uh, mangoes are just starting. So we, we can pick mangoes by the box load, uh, not only from our own trees, but we know where a lot of kind of wild trees are that we just go and uh, pick boxes up and bring them back. So we get plenty of that. Uh, jackfruit, we've got jackfruit in the garden too, and mm. we had quite a lot of jackfruit this year, so we just go out in the garden and pick a jackfruit and eat that too. Oh my gosh. We still how- buy some fruit. And, and, you know, for those that don't know, a lot of people don't know what jackfruit is, Mango. <laughs> uh, yeah. for, for those that don't know, it, if I'm not mistaken, it's the biggest fruit in the world. It's it's the biggest tree fruit in the world. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think there are fruits that are bigger that grow on vines, like you know, maybe watermelon or, or maybe a pumpkin, which is which is a, also technically a fruit. Pumpkin, it's got the seed inside it. Yeah. Pumpkins can get bigger than jackfruits, but jackfruits, yeah, they can get up to forty kilograms. Uh, one fruit, I think that's the Guinness Book of Records, something something around that size. Uh, they're a huge fruit. They're, they're a real family fruit. You take one off the tree and you, you can sit down in a, in a circle around the jackfruit and just eat that one jackfruit. It's a party. Make it, you know, everybody get a meal from it. It's a party. It's a jackfruit party. <laughs> jackfruit party. <laughs> we have a, uh, a thing with the seeds because I believe that we have like a symbi- symbiotic pact with the tree that the fruit is the, the fruit is actually as well as being the only food that, that is kind of readily edible without any change. Uh, it's also the only food which, which is 100% uh, karmic freely given hmm. so when you go to a tree and you take a jackfruit you, you're not harming the tree at all you're not the tree is uh, benefiting from the fact that you're taking it because you're then going to dis- be dispersing the seeds so i believe that we have this symbiotic pack with fruit trees that that when we eat the 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 fruit rather than discard the seed uh, into the rubbish bin or whatever so it's never going to have any chance of ever growing we discard the seeds into wasteland, which is next to the house. Mm. And uh, we've got kind of fruit trees coming up in that plot. It's, it's land that I'm never going to sort of get in there and, and clean or anything. It's just wild land. It's actually in a gully, which is next to the house. I'm throwing throwing the seeds in there and there's all kinds of fruit trees coming up mm. from, from this way of dispersing the seeds. Right. 
Oh man. Yes. Jackfruit. Free jackfruit. It it's yeah. exp- it's expensive up here, my friend. <laughs> uh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Yeah. You know? It really is, yeah. man. It tastes like bubble gum. Yeah, bubble gum fruit. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. so th- that's amazing. And I saw I saw photos on your Facebook page where you have groups of people and you have these big fruit feasts and everyone's hanging out like it's a barbecue, but it's all fruit. You know? Do you have Do you have lots of guests and community? Yeah. Uh, well, we th- these gatherings happen once every uh, couple of months now. I think more or less two, two, every two or three months or something, somebody will organize one in the area and uh, there's maybe 20 people turn up to them. Mm. They, we just kind of, it's like a potluck. You, you bring along some fruit or a fruit salad. Uh, not everybody's eating fruit. In fact, I think it's just Kurt and I that are eating 100% fruit, but people bring in salads as well with lettuce and things that, they're, that they've made before. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're things that happen. They're nice. It's nice to catch up with people. We all come out of the woodwork. Right. Yeah. Uh, it looks like it's all peace, you know? Mm. How has your fruitarian lifestyle and your lifestyle in general, how has that all increased your peace and your spirituality through the years? Because like you said, you're trying to go as barefoot as possible. Your hair's growing out. Your beard's growing out. You're, 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 you're just growing with the yeah. universe you know how, how have things changed for you yeah in that way well i i i think uh, it's difficult to say whether things happen because i'm eating fruit or just because i'm uh, you you kind of maturing in life which we all do anyway i suppose but maybe it sped up some things my maturity in some ways and it makes me think a lot more about about life the universe and everything really you just kind of uh, when you're out in the garden and you're watching things grow and you listen to, to the bees and, you, and the birds come and land close to you and you see the wallabies or the kangaroos, uh, it, it kind of, it does make you think about life. It makes you question everything really, especially coming from that contrast of living in a city and going to work and being in an office all day and suddenly now it, your life is like this where you're just you're just more in tune with it with with the way things should be mm. so i think that's a, a lot of that is is because of the way um i'm eating too i suppose it would be the fact that you eat fruit it clears you up inside your body gets clearer i remember mm. before i uh, started eating raw i went to a yoga meditation retreat in um in denmark and uh uh, I had an awful lot of trouble uh, breathing properly because my sinuses were so blocked mm. from eating the cooked food that I was eating, especially a lot of bread. And I could never really get any uh, or the full benefit from the experience because my, my nostrils were so blocked. Mm. And you're supposed to do these exercises where you breathe through your nose and out through your mouth. And I, I just well, was forever blocked and I would get colds a couple of times a year and because you don't that doesn't happen anymore if you if you do get a bit of minor detox it's over within a day or two generally speaking yeah um so yeah it just everything is and because now when you do breathe clearer it does actually open your mind up more when the blockages sure. aren't there it's you know you're you're, you're unblocked so you can just helps you tune into everything in a, in a better way. Yeah, that's the whole essence of our, our, our bodies is not to be blocked. That, that's, that's the whole philosophy that we want to reach is just no blockages, whether it's blood, lymph, or energy, right? We don't want to be constipado or in any way. So mm-hmm. not, not constipated anywhere, do we? We, we don't want to be about sinuses blocked or as you say limps anything really it's all about unblocking ourselves which helps us then unblock our minds and recognize things for what they really are Mm -hmm. i came across a a really interesting term just a couple of days ago actually i'd never seen it before but i'm not sure if you've heard of it. it's called westico no i haven't Uh, it's uh, apparently the um 
uh, Native Americans, when the first Westerners uh, started in invading the continent, they recognized uh, them of having an illness, um, which they termed as Wetiko. Mm. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. It's spelled W-E-T-I-K-O. And uh, basically, they, they saw that the Westerners were all suffering from something uh, which is akin to cannibalism, not necessarily eating your own species, but eating anything really that was in your path, whether, uh, whether it had a consciousness, or whether it was living or not. The whole idea of the Western philosophy is that we should, we should grow, we should keep consuming, and anything that stands in the way, it's fair game and it's actually morally correct uh, to get rid of it, to, mm. to get rid of things that are standing in the way of progress, which has allowed uh, Westerners to kind of uh, wipe out indigenous cultures uh, all over the planet that, that, that opposed uh, the, the progress of the Western way of thinking. And the Native American Indians, they termed this Wetiko. They, Wetiko was what they saw people suffering from. And Wetiko... Uh, is self-perpetuating. So once you're kind of in it, it's very, very difficult to even recognize that you're suffering from Wetiko. In fact, you'll do your utmost to defend it. You, mm. you kind of, anybody that comes in the way of what the, this way of thinking will be considered ludicrous or a danger to society, a danger to progress. So they're mm. kind of, uh, yeah, it, it, I found it a, a very uh, enlightening really to read about this because I, I mean I know these were obviously things which I've thought about before but it just gave a word to the illness that, that we're all suffering from yeah that's worth looking into for sure to the listeners as well as myself do you also include nuts in your diet at all like almonds or walnuts or anything not at all nuts contain the potential for uh, a new life a new tree mm. within them so when you eat the nut, you are actually destroying the life of a potential new tree. Mm. But not only that, from a health point of view, uh, you'll realize that when you eat nuts, because pretty much every nut that's commercially available has been heat treated, whereas fruit that's commercially available, I guess some of it's probably been irradiated. And But you can do your best to source fruit which isn't, fruit, source fruit which is uh, maybe local or organic. But uh, nuts, they've all been heat treated. Right. And because of that heat treatment, there's no um, natural means for the body to realize when it's had too much. All right. Yeah, it makes sense. Well said. Uh, a lot of fruitarians that I've heard of incorporate nuts. Like Gandhi was fruits and nuts. They were just trying to get, quote unquote, good fat. But you can do that with avocado. Mm. Avocado is a fruit. Yeah, 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 you're not going to get, you're not going to do yourself any favors by eating nuts, I don't think. Uh, you can control, if you can kind of control and say, I'll have three nuts, then maybe you, you, you can kind of keep doing that for a long time. But right. the trouble with nuts is that they're like chocolate, that you're going to eat one, and yeah, then you're right. going to, mm, that's nice, I'll eat more. And it, it's very difficult for the body to actually know when to stop. Your There's... mind has to step in and say, I have to stop now. Yeah. The same as with chocolate. Yeah, they're snacky. They're snacky. They're snacky, yeah. Yeah. They're like a cooked food. The same effect on the body as cooked food because of that heat treatment. If you can go to a, a walnut tree that's not been the, the walnut that's out and sun dried and you can pick a walnut off the tree, you'll find it's very milky. It's got a very different texture to a walnut that you'll buy in the shop. Mm. And when you eat that walnut, you, you may enjoy the taste of it. But after you've eaten two or three, there'll be a natural stop that you don't want to eat anymore. The same way as if you're eating a fruit that you, if you eat a certain amount, you think mm, doesn't taste the same anymore or it burns my lips or my tongue. Or slight, something about it has changed and you naturally push it aside. And mm. that uh, will happen if you're eating a, a fresh, truly fresh watery nut, but not if you eat any uh, commercial nuts. Right. Now through your journey, did you have any natural health teachers help you out, whether alive or, you know, dead? Did you 
pick up any books that helped you along your way? Anything like that? I think, yeah, I definitely read a lot, uh, a lot about, uh, I mean, when I first uh, turned on to raw food, there was one particular guy, he wasn't an author, but he gave a talk on the subject and everything that he said made sense to me. Hmm. His name was Francisco Martin. He was a Spanish fellow. And uh, afterwards, uh, I, I did read, I mean, I, I read all the classics like Arnold Eretz and uh, Herbert Shelton. Herbert mm-hmm. Shelton, I think, it, it was particularly, I, I found his, his writing very fascinating. Yeah. Eric, both Eric and Shelton, really. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of others, really, that I, that I uh, S.E. Honorable and T.C. Fry. And, uh, basically, at the time when, uh, when I was transiting, I got hold of as much as I could do to read on the subject because I felt like I needed, uh, I needed inspiration really. And that's what the books did. I think reading books about what you want to do is, is going to inspire you to do them because you're reading about people that have succeeded already. Right. Absolutely. Uh, my favorite, it was Hilton Hotima. You know, he, he, he talks about breatharianism too. He does. And how yeah. fruit is... I've read uh, Man's Higher Conscious. Yeah. Man's Higher Conscious is one of my favorite books ever, ever, yeah, ever, I, ever. Yeah, yeah. That's like a must-read for every human being walking the earth. Mm. <laughs> it really yeah. is. Because he breaks down the science of it. He relates it back to the Bible. He relates it back to Indian gurus. He he, yeah. he he breaks down the structure of the body, and yeah, you know, fruit being a fruitarian is like two steps away from breatharianism, right? Because mm. the, the next step mm-hmm. would be liquidarianism, all liquids, yeah, and then yeah. it would be breatharianism. So, where are, do you flirt with that idea, or you're good where you're at? Uh, uh, well. We tend to drink most of what we eat anyway. Mm. So um, most of the majority of what we eat is drunken. We, we make, I make in the morning, every morning I make a whole load of juices and then we'll drink them throughout the day. And then uh, around uh, midday, we'll have a salad, maybe, maybe. Um, sometimes we won't have a salad, especially Kirta, she'll skip uh, eating salad more than I will. So she'll ju- just be drinking juices. Right. But I'll have a salad. and But the salad, when I, I mean, literally, I'm just talking, it's like a small bowl, much smaller than when you, uh, we've seen some raw fooders and they'll just pile on so much in their in their plates. But, um, uh, yeah. And when I talk about salad, I'm not obviously not talking about green. There's no green leaves in there. I, I'm talking about um, grated zucchini, uh, cucumber, and tomato, and a bit of avocado. Which is all fruit, that which will be, a lot of people don't know. Which is, that's right, they're all fruit, mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I think uh, I think as time goes by, maybe eating more, more drinking more juice, I am, uh, I am open to the idea of breatharianism, but having never met anybody that's doing it, but having seen some people that have tried to do it and, uh, and not been very successful at all, mm. I am very kind of i don't know well i'm skeptical but at the same time i'm open-minded so right. I, I would love for it to be true but i i just don't know right and who knows i mean if one day i feel like i don't want to eat anymore then sure i'm open to that idea sorry do you ever splice in like water fasting or anything i have in the past uh, i've done a lot of water fasting um nothing more than 14 days Mm. Well, I've that's... done a few 10 day fasts uh, and a lot of three day fasts and a few dry fasts as well. But mm. I, 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 yeah, in recent times, not so much because um, I, I feel like I'm at a, like I'm only, I'm like 52, 53 kilograms or something, mm-hmm. which uh, for a lot of people, they would see that as too skinny, but I feel fine on that, that weight. But I don't like to drop it below, much below 50. If I go below 50, I start to feel that's not good for me. And the truth is, if I if I do water fast, I quickly go be, below 50, 50 within a matter of days. You know, I can lose one kilogram a day water fasting. Right. But uh, last year I did a I did 50 days of juice, just just juice, 
uh, mostly watermelon. And um, uh, that I found that I hardly lost any weight doing that. So I can maintain my weight by just drinking juices, but by not eating at all, I, I lose weight too quickly. And I'm not, yeah, I don't really want that to happen. I, I do juice feasts, we'll call it, food vacations, if you want to call it. I do, I do that at least 60 days a year. Yeah. And I sometimes feel so darn good. I, I flirt with the idea <laughs> of yeah. just staying on liquids. Yeah. Because yeah. life is so simple. There's mm. no sitting down for a meal. There's no preparing. It's gulp, gulp, done. And you're, and you're full. Yeah. yeah. No, I think it's a good thing. I mean, uh, I could well, well see myself becoming liquidarian. That's mm. a huge possibility, I think. Breatharianism, I'm not too sure. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I have listeners who are probably listening to this and their minds might be a little blown right now because they're like, wow, this dude over here in Australia, <laughs> he's on all fruit. Yeah. Yeah. What if 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 somebody yeah. wanted to give this diet style a little try? What yeah. what tips would you give someone? Just two, three, maybe four tips, just for a beginner. Number one, mate. What you do when you're eating only fruit is you eat what appeals to the body. So don't try and restrict yourself with anything. I think especially for a beginner, don't try and think, oh, I shouldn't have too many avocados because that's too much fat if your body is wanting them i think you should go ahead and let yourself eat them so you're not kind of you know a lot of people jump into it too quick and think oh i should only eat mono uh fruit which in at the end of the day it may be good to be eating just one particular fruit at a time but once you start restricting yourself too much you're making it too difficult for yourself to succeed so i think that it's very uh, very good to kind of think well yeah i'll make myself a fruit salad and mix things together because i enjoy that mm. and and do that and make yourself a salad and, and you'll you'll be surprised how much a salad of cucumber grated zucchini tomato and avocado can be so satisfying and uh, if necessary make yourself two or three bowls a day because it's going to fill you up mm-hmm. it's going to fill you up but you want to feel full really with it but you don't want to eat too much in my opinion i think a lot of people also they push it and they eat too much there is a there is a uh, i know that there is this school of thought going around that you, you're supposed to eat a lot a lot of calories certain amount of calories mm. now we don't count calories at all and uh, in the past we've been accused of calorie restricting but i don't believe in calorie restricting either because a restriction means that you're actually saying oh i won't eat any more than this even though you're hungry I think right. you should eat until it's satiated. So you, right. uh, when you're eating, you just eat what appeals and you eat until you feel satisfied. And, uh, and you don't try and make too much of an extreme out of it because it's already extreme enough probably for most people coming over to fruit. But right. particularly if you're including that tomato, zucchini and uh, cucumber salad with the avocado, that actually is going to really ease your path into it because that that's kind of probably the closest thing that you're going to get to eating a uh, something more you know substantial and filling and stodgy that people yeah crave. because the avocado is very satiating the, the healthy fat in there yeah. yeah yeah absolutely i mean over time you, your needs will change and over time you'll realize actually no i'm eating too many avocados and it's not good for me and you 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 can make choices based on the stage that you're at mm. but you were talking about a newbie a full-on newbie coming into it and uh of course the other uh, uh, point is to, to move yourself away as much as you can from temptation because uh, obviously even uh, this is the same for people going on to a raw food diet that the biggest obstacle that you're going to get is your own your own body's uh, craving substances that it's been used to getting and that are, have been frankly uh, addictive Mm. That, that your body is addicted to and you just want to have more of it you need that kind of stodgy thing and you need to tell your mind at some point no this is not good this is not what you want to do and you've got to break away from it so moving away from temptation that that's also a huge thing i think 
that, that will help you. And we've had people come with to us, uh, family members mostly, that are that have stayed with us for a period of time, also friends. And we have a house rule that here, uh, and there are no there are no temptations anywhere close to us, and we're 15 kilometres from town. And if somebody's coming staying with us, they're basically relying on us to take them around. So w- here, the house rule is only fruit is to be consumed. Mm. It's one of the house rules. And uh, uh, we've had people that think they're scratched their head and think, I don't know if I can do this. But they've come here and they've stayed with us from periods of between six weeks and five months. And they've eaten only fruit with us. And you'd be surprised at how easy it has been for virtually everybody they just no kind of like complaints or saying i'm craving this or i could really eat a a cookie or a cake or whatever it might be um they happy uh, eating only fruit with us and you should see the way people change it just oh yeah it's you know short of miraculous really to see the the changes of people those two main things, really, I think they're the main things. You've you just got to not restrict yourself. Uh, don't try and take it too extreme by eating just mono. Do that later if you want. Yeah, by all yeah. means. And, like a, and like a grape. remove yourself from temptation. Yeah, like a, whole, like a grape feast or something. Uh, my, my tip to people is to become a fruit expert. I'm, I'm going to use it, the word loosely, but... Like, know your fruit. Like, don't eat unripe fruit. Like, know when it's ripe and, right? Like, I remember in the beginning, I would eat oranges that weren't ripe and my lips would start burning. Yeah. (laughs) And so I had to learn things the hard way and I had to become, you know, just like somebody out in the wilderness would would become knowledgeable Mm. on how to make a fire or how to make some shelter, you know yeah what berries not to eat right like you have to sort of become an expert with the fruit if you're going to be eating it yeah that's an interesting point you're you're bringing up there kevin because um Mm -hmm. i know uh there are other species uh, of animal on this planet which are primarily uh frugivorous fruit bat for example or Mm. we classify many of the great apes as, as being frugivorous animals mm-hmm. where whenever they're given the choice, they'll choose fruit over leaves, but they eat a lot of leaves at times when there's a shortage. But in any case, the, the thing I want to say is that of all the frugivorous species on this planet, we are very, very exceptional because we have a, a, a limited window where the fruit is ideal for us. We don't want it to be underripe. We don't want it to be overripe. We want it to be in that Goldilocks zone where it's just right for us. Mm. And we as a species of frugivores, we're the only ones that have this real kind of this, this need of getting it in that particular zone. Because a lot of the animals that eat only fruit, they'll eat fruit which is underripe, they'll eat fruit which is going rotten and overripe, and they don't seem to have any effect from it. Whereas us, we get adversely affected by eating fruit which isn't in that Goldilocks zone. It it makes perfect sense. I think an avocado is a good fruit to look at as an example, right? when When it's unripe, it's hard like a rock mm-hmm. yeah. and when it's too ripe your finger goes right through it and the inside gets really brown yeah yeah it smells different as well i mean the taste is different everything about it it, it is wrong you know i mean yeah. Yeah, there, even one one other extreme of, of fruit which really shows this is the ackee fruit i don't know if you've ever tried ackee it's the national fruit of jamaica no man. and ackee fruit it, it uh it, it tastes a little bit cheesy, but aki, when it's on the tree and it's all closed up, if you were to take it up the tree and open it you and eat it, uh, um, it's so poisonous that you could die. Mm. Um, if you uh, wait for the, what happens is with aki is it opens up like a flower. Mm. So it, uh, it's got pods in this rather the same way that durian, do, uh, durian does. Mm. But the, uh, the pods will open up by themselves on the tree. And when they open up, that's when you eat them. Mm. But if you wait for a little bit too long 
and you eat them when they're starting to go mushy, you can uh, make yourself sick. You won't kill yourself, but you make yourself. You can make yourself sick. Get tummy yeah. upset from it. So yeah. ackee is really one fruit. You've just got to have it in that right zone. Otherwise, you, you're going to do yourself some harm. Dude, that fruit is only up here in the Northeast as a cooked entree at Jamaican restaurants. Yeah, we, ha- we have a I've we have heard a the Jamaicans cook them. Yeah, we have a big West Indian population here in the uh, Hartford yeah. and New York area and the aki is it's it's on the menu mango <laughs> but it ain't raw. Uh, no. I don't think it transports. The thing with aki is that they you you've got like uh, the window is very small so once they kind of open uh, you've got to eat them within a few days. Otherwise they're going to go off. So it's like it's one of many one of the many fruits that you're not going to find uh, being transported somewhere and sold in a in a market elsewhere in the world right. other than where they're growing. Do you have pomegranates out there? Uh, I've got a pomegranate tree in the garden. Oh. I, I planted him planted him myself. So, uh, oh. but he's he's got some flowers on him. I think but he's never given us any fruit yet. He's still quite young. I mean, bear in mind we've only been living here since two thousand and thirteen. Uh, so, a lot of our trees are still very small and not really giving us fruit. And some some trees take a good ten years, right? Absolutely. We've been patient with them. You've got to be patient. Yeah, yeah man. They're alive. <laughs> they're alive. Yeah, yeah. So long as they're alive and growing, we're, we're happy, even if they're not giving us anything. Because one day we know they will. And obviously, we don't use any chemicals of any kind. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that I'm, I'm feeding them with really is mulch. So cut grass around them. And all the, all the compost, fruit compost scraps and seeds, not seeds, but the scraps that we have, it all gets returned to the earth mm-hmm. here. The same for our, our toilet. We Everything, all our toilet waste goes into the garden around the trees. Mm. I mean, it, this, yeah. this just sounds like a, a paradise you're living in. To me, you know, yeah. it, it's just, yeah, it is. you're going you're gonna to have pomegranates any year now. Like that's mind blowing. Pomegranates cost $3 here, man. Like, yeah, and yeah. pomegranate is arguably pound for pound one of the healthiest foods there is on this planet. Yeah, pomegranate uh, juice. I, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you're gonna be able to just walk outside and just take it. Hopefully, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't. We don't know anybody else with a pomegranate tree. I think we have a very special packed with fruit trees i think you know humans and fruit trees it's the garden of eden i mean it i think it's i mean not everybody's uh, into the bible or in, into the religion of, of any sort some people are atheists but i think a lot of people that are and most religions talk of original garden of eden of sorts and many prophecies indicate that it will one day come to pass again that we're living in that way. Mm-hmm. But the only thing that's really preventing us from making that happen is just the habits that we have which go contrary to that. You know, mm-hmm. while we've still got this mindset that we should be, or, or that it's okay to take somebody's life purely because we feel like eating them. Right. And with I mean, fruit, you know, it's it's like you know, it really is such a special. I can't underline it more because uh, our choice of becoming fruitarian was very similar to the choice of becoming uh, vegan. Mm. That we didn't any longer wish to do harm to animals. So becoming fruitarian, it's kind of like we don't really we're we're giving plants the benefit of the doubt that they are alive, they're living their lives. That if we were in their place, living their life we would not want to be harmed. Mm. We would not want to be uprooted or chopped down or, or pulled up before a, for any reason. So I think by choosing fruit, you're, you're fully giving respect to plants and uh, animals and plants, both of them. That's right, because there is some agitation with carrots and potatoes and spinach. And Absolutely. Whatnot. You you pull up a carrot and you're you're killing the taking the whole life of the carrot. It's it's gone. It's mm-hmm. gone. 
Yeah. You know, you take an apple from a tree, the tree is living. The tree is benefited by you taking it. Mm-hmm. It's a huge difference. Huge mm-hmm. difference. Absolutely. So, Mango, where where can people find your books? Uh, my website is fruitnut.net. Fruitnut. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, fruitnut.net. All and right. it's got a link to all my books there. Um, they say the last one that I've written is called 2020 Vision, mm. uh, which is basically explaining ways to go beyond veganism. So if, if we're in it for the animals, if we're in it for the environment, and because we want to reduce the harm that our presence is causing on this planet, there are many other things that we can do besides cutting out animal products from our shopping cart. Mm. I think that uh, even the idea that we're living in cities is inherently destructive on so many ways. Cities are very unnatural places and they mess with our minds really because we're bombarded consistently by messages to, mm-hmm. to continue being a good consumer or to to do things which are harmful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think that... Uh, you know, one of the one of the biggest steps that we can take, apart from changing the way we uh, act as consumers, is is just uh, simply about moving out of the city and getting back. Uh, e- even if we can't afford to buy land, uh, which at the end of the day shouldn't ever be up for sale anyway, because land is mm-hmm. land is there. Nobody really owns it. It's just an illusion that we choose to accept. Mm-hmm. But even if we're we're playing into that illusion we we don't have money to buy land there are still ways that we can move out of the city there are still ways that we can get back to nature by joining a community uh, finding like-minded people that maybe we can join up with and and maybe invest in something together there's ways to do it anybody that wants to do it can do it that's my yeah, absolutely. Very strong belief. That's something that we explore on this podcast is uh, creating communities or going to an ashram or a monastery or, you know, getting yeah. getting away from not necessarily society as a whole, but yeah. getting away from the, the programming of society and, and getting to some better fresh air is a big one too, right? Absolutely, that's a huge part of it. The cities are, have got a dome of pollution over them. You're yep. breathing in bad air every every day that we're every hour, second that we're living there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a huge thing. And I think that also the more that we can relinquish power uh, from the big corps and and the, and the government, uh, the better it is. Because these 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 companies and organisations they don't exist for our benefit they exist purely for profit Mm. to make money which is destroying the planet Mm. destroying the environment destroy it it's all about destruction really growth means destruction or or financial growth i think somebody once said uh, very wisely that behind every uh, every great fortune lies a great crime and Mm. that's so very true uh and, and you're probably very well aware that the, the vast majority of the world's resources and and financial wealth lies in the hands of very, very few. Yeah. I think the, the top like 0.1% uh, of, the, of the people on the planet own as much as the bottom 50% or yeah. even more. Pretty much. We had to cre- create our own kingdom of heaven, man. That it sounds like that's what yep. you've done over there. Uh, it sounds, yeah. I mean, you got me wanting to hop on a plane, brother. I mean, <laughs> it sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. To, you know, I, I want to kind of make it clear that really, it doesn't matter where you're at, because you might think, ah, Mango is so fortunate. He's living out there. He's so blessed to be where he is, and he's living in kind of self-made little, little piece of paradise, and. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm the first one to acknowledge that. I've, I've been extremely blessed. But I came from, I came from living in the city too. And uh, a while ago, you know, a few decades ago, I, I may have thought, well, how, how could I possibly get to the point where I'm living the kind of life where that I truly want to live and where I'm getting back to nature and, and just, you know, this blessed space that I'm in now. And, 
and I don't want people to think, oh, just I'm privileged. It's not always been the case, and and I'm only privileged because I've made it happen. I've I've wanted the right things in life. I've wanted to lessen harm. I've wanted to move forward. I've wanted to progress in this way, and the universe has mm-hmm. has uh, has opened the doors for me. That's because the way it works. I think once you're more in tune, once you're more in tune with where you should be going, the universe starts helping you to get there. Whereas if you keep making excuses, you're going to keep finding those doors are locked. That's right. Because you're not even trying to open them. They're not even maybe locked. They're just closed. You've got yeah. to make the effort to open them. Absolutely. And, and you know, I, I have an episode coming up all about ambition and how ambition can be a disease. And I, I think some people get stuck in the corporate world or the entertainment world and they're trying to climb some sort of ladder. You've taken yourself off yeah. that ladder and you're taking that yeah. that ambition and you're putting it towards personal development. Absolutely. I mean, I was in the corporate world too. I was working for a big company and, and uh, yeah, going to work every day and, and I broke free. And it was a, it was a, everybody can say, oh, I can't do that. It's too difficult. But it was extremely difficult for me too. I remember it was, it was like, uh, there's so many unknowns before you break free. You don't Mm. know how things are going to pan out. You don't know what's going to happen. But the more that you can uh, trust that everything will be okay, the more things become okay. Yeah. You know, this is just a big school, isn't it? This is a big mystery school. It's a big school. And we're just working Absolutely. towards our graduation. <laughs> yeah. And we, we certainly not, we certainly haven't come here to be stuck in an office all day. No. Pursuing money for what end? So you can buy, you know, put, put it down on a mortgage and be in debt the rest of your life. And, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't know, just you're stuck there. You're just stuck in a routine where you just how you're a slave, really. Because that's, that's what yeah. most people are. You know, we're slaves. Once you're starting making money, uh, it actually is a very, it's an addiction in itself. Mm. So it becomes more and more difficult to leave it behind because you're thinking, okay, I'm making so much every month and I'm stacking it all up. Uh, but if I stop, I'm not going to be getting anything coming in anymore. And that's a scary thought for everybody, really. Uh, so I think that at the end of the day, it's really more about faith. So if you're a young person fresh out of school and you haven't got money to do anything, I think uh, that potential for you to, to for that personal growth is still very much there before you've even got the money. Mm-hmm. You can make a choice, look around, okay, I, I want to go and live in a community in Costa Rica, contact people there. If you're, if you're a good person and uh, hardworking and, uh, you know, kind of pleasant to be around, you can make that work for you. You can yeah. live that kind of life straight away. You don't have to wait or earn a lot of money to do it. You can do it straight away. That's right. That's right. When I, I have an ashram that I visit in New York. Yep. And, yeah. And uh, this summer I met a gentleman who, <laughs> man, he's been all over the United States and he goes from community to community, to community, community. He'll stay at a community yeah. for like two years and then he moves on to another yeah. community. And then he, you know, he works in the kitchen or he does housekeeping and he, he's yeah. living a, a, a pretty free life he's you know he has no need to go to a job and and earn oh, fifty right. fifty thousand dollars a year then he's probably not even earning any money all he's doing is having a good time he goes from ashram to ashram you know they maybe don't even pay him money but what does he need money for if he's getting food there he's getting bored there he's getting good company there mm-hmm. uh, you know this is definitely a, a choice that people can make and uh, to begin with i was doing something quite similar i mean i was on a bicycle for a year and i didn't really know where i was going i was just getting up in the morning and and biking somewhere and seeing wherever fate took me really that was that was yeah that was uh, the beginning of my journey really because when i left the corporate world i well directly i I, yeah a lot of things happened it will all be explained in my biography but my journey has been quite kind of wild and wonderful in many ways so many things happened to me uh, in those initial stages of letting go i i really yeah look back on it with fondness you know, i have a, i have a guru and one of his great teachings is 
he calls it the let go. That's what he calls it, mm -hmm. the let go. It's yeah. another way of saying surrender. And, yeah. But the let go, the let go, and, and yeah. the, the let go can apply to that corporate job you had. It can apply to the, yeah. the money that you were just talking about. Or it can it, it, it can apply to just your mind racing and going to the past and the future and just lay down and let go, you know. Yeah, yeah. we're cl we're clinging into too many things, aren't we, Mango? Absolutely. And as I often tell people, the, the chains that bind us, they're not bound around our wrists. We hold them in our fists. Yeah. So Man. it's up to us at any time we can let go, let go. Yeah, man, your your autobiography is going to be very interesting. I'm also working on something similar, and I've had things happen to me that I used to be in the entertainment business, Mango. I used to be, you know, a public figure, and yep. and so you know, my life changed around 30 years old, and so there's a story to share there, and some of the things. People I've met, mystics, Dr. Robert Morse is a big one for me. Yep. 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 There's just so much that happens in someone's life that throws you into that river. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The let go. Yeah. Back to the ocean. Back to the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I, yeah. I just, I, you know, once we let go and we get cut through these illusions, I think it's like life is kind of like a joke in a good way. And, yeah, you know, instead yeah. of instead of life's a bitch and then you die, I prefer yeah. I prefer life's a joke and yeah. laugh. You know, <laughs> it's really good to have a sense of humor. You, know? you got to be an observer, the observer. Yeah, yep. you got to look yeah. at it all, yeah. witness it all, and become so self-aware. Yeah. yeah, and then I, I'm very much the observer. I don't, are you familiar with the Enneagram? Yeah. Oh yeah, I've, uh, George Gertschiff brought that out a few decades ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but yeah. Uh, I'm personality type number five, and uh, they're also classified as the un unenlightened Buddha uh, or, or the observer. And I feel very much the observer. I kind of like watch things and watch myself too when I'm, you know, I like even if I don't watch myself immediately. Uh, after I've done something, I'll I'll look back at myself and think, hmm, okay, yeah, fair enough something to learn from that yeah that's what it's all about is just being so becoming so self-aware and then the more yeah. self-aware the more witnessing and observing you do the veils mm. of illusions start to crumble they crumble, they crumble revelation right? after revelation yeah just, absolutely. Yep, yep absolutely and i i think being a fruitarian is a not only are you helping the earth and you're helping your body, but it's also a device to help you dissolve ego. Yeah, I think so. Especially if you're doing it with the right frame of mind. And you, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I do think a lot of people get into it and it, it is for them about maybe making a status of themselves mm -hmm. from doing that or uh, through fitness or health, I think, but I, I don't know. For me, uh, my, my goal has always been about the understanding of the golden rule. It's about karma. Mm. It's about wanting to lessen the harm that my presence is causing here on the earth. Yeah. And the more I think that you can actually be in tune with that being the reason for you making changes, the more uh, difficult it makes you to break away from doing that. True indeed. But where can <laughs> where can people come say hello to you on social media? Uh, I'm on Facebook, um, Mingo Watsak. Uh, just easy to find on Facebook. Uh, yeah, I'm only on so I'm only on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter or I don't know what else there is. Uh, Instagram or Spotify. This conversation could go on for another few hours, my friend. But uh, <laughs> it's definitely. Yeah over where i expected so i'm gonna have to cut this short and thank you for that and man i, I just i really appreciate your time and i know we're on different time zones you're in the morning i'm at night right now yeah yeah <laughs> I, I hear the liveliness 
of your area and your background, you know. Can you hear the cicadas? I do. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, uh, a couple of hours ago, they were so deafening that if you go outside, you need like ear earplugs or something because they're just <laughs> so, so loud. We've got a lot of eucalyptus trees and they're, yeah. Even though there isn't a cloud in the sky, when you walk underneath the eucalyptus trees, it's always raining. <laughs> it's a different world out there. We don't have any of those trees here. <laughs> yeah, things are very different. What an enlightening conversation, man. If you're looking for me and my work, webinars, books, podcasts, etc., go to drreese.com. That's doctor spelt out. And I'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to Inner Peace with Dr. Reese. If this episode opened your heart, feel free to share on social media and tell your loved ones. Also, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, may peace be with you.